Okay. Right, well, in Romans chapter 6, uh, we've been going through in the past couple weeks, and we have seen how Paul has been examining one of the glorious facets of the gospel, of the work of Christ in the gospel. And that is called union with Christ, right? He's really been emphasizing that. Certainly through verses 1 through 7, he sort of explained it, outlined it, and then he emphasized in verse 8, as we saw uh, last time, that we have died with Christ, I believe that we shall also live with him. That's part of it as well, death and life. Christ's death and life is ours as well, knowing this, that Christ, having been raised from the dead, so he digs in a little bit more, is never to die again. Death is no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. And we'll get into this in a, a little bit in our text, how that applies. But it's a once for all death. Death is no longer master, but the life that he lives, he lives to God even now. And so consider yourselves, as we see in verse 11, Paul is emphasizing the so what? Even so, in the same manner, consider yourselves as a command. Consider yourselves, reckon yourselves, account yourself to be dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, as we saw in the past couple weeks, emphasizing and signifying that union with Christ. Apart from that union with Christ, there's no such thing as our being dead to sin and alive to God. In Christ, we are dead to sin and alive to God. So verse 11 sort of introduces us again to the so what of the doctrine, at least one of the so what's, one of the applications, one of the commands, one of the therefores of union with Christ. As uh, one scholar said it though, he says, Paul stresses here, and I would argue in our chapters, our text as well, that we must actualize in daily experience the freedom from sin's lordship that is ours again in Christ. Jesus. Notice the word that he used. Actualizing in daily experience. Doesn't mean it's not real, or union with Christ isn't real, isn't actual. But in our daily experience, it needs to happen. It needs, as some have said, to put feet to faith in our daily lives, in every single, in every single detail of our lives. This union with Christ needs to be manifest. And in our passage today, which is Romans 6, 12 through 14, Paul's going to delve into this. He's going to delve into the so what's in detail and show us that our union with Christ, you know, that our union with Christ, no problem, union with Christ transforms how we deal with sin. And again, this is just one of the so what's. It transforms how we deal with sin. You can even see that from Romans 12, uh, 6, 12, the very first word there. Therefore, it's a really important word, right? As we all know, we need to ask, what's the therefore, therefore? But let me just read the verse, and uh, we're in Romans 6, 12. Therefore, Paul says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. We'll just stop there. First, we've got to note something. What's the command here? Well, let's sin reign. Really, the force of it here, it's a very solemn, clear command that something must not happen. It's not a permissive idea like, hey, don't, don't let sin reign. Don't, you know, try not to let this happen. Do your best. You know, I know sin is kind of this or that, but don't let it, you know, that kind of thing. It's a sin must not. This cannot happen. Romans. This cannot happen, dear Christians. I command, and so he's saying, I command that this not take place. And what is the this that does not, uh, ought not take place? What is Paul forbidding? That sin reign in your mortal body, in that, so that you obey its lusts, your, the mortal body's lusts. That sin would not rule over you. That sin would not exercise total dominion over you. That sin would not rule and reign in authority and power over your mortal body. And notice what he's, and this is the 
kind of thing that we need to realize in context. Notice what he is saying. It's obvious that should not rain. Sin, but not just any sin. Look at verse 2. It's the sin that we have died to in Christ. Right? Verse 2, may it never be, how shall we who die to sin, uh, to sin still live in it? Verse 6 and 7, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin, slash sinful body, might be done away with, and we'll see where that manifests in our future glorification with Christ. It goes on to say in verse 7, for he who has died is freed from sin. We have died to sin. Paul is saying, the sin that I've just been talking about, folks, the, the one that you have died to, not just generic categories of sin or what we might think, but the sin that you died to must not reign in your mortal body. That cannot happen. There can only be one king. There can only be one Lord, one master on the throne of your heart. And in our union with Christ, there is no such thing as being under the dominion of sin and at the same time being under the dominion of Christ. And this is throughout church history has been a, a struggle with many in their personal lives and it's often manifested in this fake doctrine called carnal Christianity. Mm -hmm. You can be a carnal Christian. Oh yes, I'm saved, but I'm just living in sin and I'm, oh, I'm quote unquote struggling, but there is no struggle really, there's no battle. I'm just a carnal Christian, even sometimes, and this term can be used properly, but, oh, I'm just backslid. Oh, I've just gone off and departed. Prodigal son type of thing. We need to understand, and we're, we'll see when we get to chapter 7 in a couple years. Um, <laughs> we're going to see that the battle, I emphasize battle, with sin is, is brutal, hard, in the trenches, battle with sin. It's not easy, Paul's going to show us. But nevertheless, there needs to be a battle. Paul's saying here, sin cannot reign. Sin cannot be your absolute master. Sin cannot be in total authority over your life and in every detail of your life. That does not happen in union with Christ. We must understand this, brothers and sisters, for our own lives. And even as we counsel others and we help others, less mature Christians in us, new Christians in the faith, even those, who knows, family, friends, etc., who think they're Christian, but again, there's no fruit, there's no lordship of Christ in their lives. We need to be able to help them show, these, show them these kind of scriptures because in Christ there is one master, and his name is Christ alone. Now it's important here also in verse 12, notice what Paul specifies is the location of this reign that sin should not have in our lives. The mortal body. Now right off the bat we see, he could have said just body, but he emphasizes by saying mortal, he emphasizes our physical body, not some, you know, I don't know, some allegorical body or something like that. Our physical body, our physical selves. Which, as you guys know, was perfect. God created it perfect in Adam. Before the fall, no issues whatsoever. But after the fall, as we've seen in, for example, in Romans 5, it's been affected. In Romans 8, we'll see even together with creation, it's, it's groaning under the weight of sin. Outside of Christ, it is under the dominion of sin. It is a slave of sin. We are slaves of sin outside of Christ. Or as MacArthur has said, it's the only remaining repository where sin finds the believer vulnerable. It's really the only possible place where sin, the old self, the old flesh of nature, can have a headquarters, as it were, in our lives. Cannot destroy our souls, cannot do any but our mortal bodies. And we'll see Paul emphasizes in the next verses, even the details of it, our body parts and our brains and the thinking that comes from that. It's the only place where sin can influence us. And you notice how he, he says at the end of verse 12, so that you obey its lusts, the lusts of the flesh, the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, the pride of life. That's where he's saying sin can still influence us, but it must not reign. Though our new nature, 
By the way, we only have one new nature. There's no, we don't have two natures, so they duke it out for us, for authority. No, we have one new nature in Christ. Though that new nature is, if you will, incarcerated in a mortal body, which is still subject to death, which is still subject to the onslaught of sin. And we, we see this in chapter 7, verse 24 at the end, where Paul says, Wretched man that I am. Ah, you can hear his emotion there. Who will free me, he says, from the body of this death, this death body, this, this carcass that I'm in. It's weighing me down in the struggle with sin. We need to understand, though, that, that though that's the case, our being united with Christ's resurrection ensures our future release from the sinful tendencies from, from that subject to deathness of this body. It will happen. Even in chapter 6, we saw, in, and I read this in verse 6, knowing that our old self is crucified with him, in order that our body of sin, sinful body, might be done away with, or conquered in that sense, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Later on in the book, in chapter 8, verse 11, here what Paul says on the same subject. He says, but, this, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and does it? I pray it does. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, will, future tense, future tense, will also give life to your mortal bodies, same word there, through the Spirit who dwells in you. He will give an ultimate life. It will happen. And the transformation of our body from a mortal body, that is one that is subject to death, one that will die, furthermore, one that is subject to the temptations and the lust and the desires of sin, will be transformed into one that is immortal, that is no longer subject to death, that is no longer even subject to the sickness and the effects of the fall, but furthermore, that is in no way subject to the claims and the attacks of sin that come through our lust and desires and our thinking, etc. Perfected forever when we are glorified, either when we die or when Christ comes back and raptures us. And this is, again, there's many places in Scripture where it says this, but again, sticking in the context of the book of Romans, for our first cross-reference here in 8.23, Paul says, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Why? Because we're waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body, the redemption of our body that's going to come in the future, even outside the book of Romans, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, Paul states this very clearly. Where he reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's our Lord Jesus Christ going to do? Verse 21, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, his glorified body, and all the privileges and perfections that come with that by the exertion of the power that he has in and of himself. This is our hope. This is the answer to Paul's at chapter, end of chapter 7, cry of the soul, and I hope and pray it is yours as well. Oh, wretched man that I am. These sinful proclivities of my fleshly desires and the, the ungodly goals and thinking and all this stuff. Oh, wretched man that I, that I am. Who can free me? And he says, but thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he'll do what he promised. Philippians chapter 3, 20 to 21. He's going to come. And when I die, or when he comes to bring us to himself, that will happen. That freedom will happen. But does this mean that in this present time, before we die, before the rapture, does that mean our struggle with sin is hopeless? Does that mean we're just like a kid being bullied by a big old bully and he just sits there and is beat around? 
and can do literally nothing? Does that mean we just got to be tossed here and about by all the waves of temptation and we can just do nothing? Certainly not. This side of glory, even, even as I said before, we are incarcerated, as it were, in this mortal body. That is not the case. It doesn't have to be defeat after defeat, after defeat after defeat. It doesn't have to be a life of thinking, of desiring one thing, but not being able to fulfill what God wants of us. It doesn't have to be like that. I mean, it's implicit in Paul's command here. He's telling Christians this cannot happen. This shall not happen. And we'll see he gets into more detail in the, in the next verses. It's implied here, but it's made very clear in Romans 8.13. Romans 8.13, Paul says there, For if you are living according to the flesh, i.e., if you are living in that state of total dominion under sin, if it is, there is no victory whatsoever. There's no fruits of the Spirit, as Galatians says. If there's just nothing, if you are living according to flesh, guess what? You must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, not in some uh, second level of you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit, like some say, or not some higher level of sanctification, not even in our glorification, no, no. Now, if you are putting to death the deeds of the body you will live, <coughs> it is possible, it is promised, <coughs> it is commanded, and it is empowered, we'll see this way more in the chapter 8, but by the Spirit. In and of yourself you couldn't do it, but you have the Holy Spirit. You are able to deny sin, its reign over your life and over your mortal body. Sin is a defeated enemy that still try to, tries to straggle on. I've been reading in my devotional time in the Old Testament historical books for Samuel and stuff. There's a lot of battles in those. And a lot of the time when you read of what happens after a battle or when an enemy is defeated, it's not everyone dies and, oh, okay, it's done. Oftentimes what happens is it says they pursued them to all the way, for example, the Philistines, all the way to, to Gath and to Ashkelon. The, the defeated army running away from the victorious army. That's what sin is. It still tries to straggle on and maybe regroup a little bit and try to attack, but it is a defeated enemy because of Christ, because of what he did, not what you do or are doing, but because of what Christ did. And it's, it's doing its best, last ditch effort to try to conquer you, to try to reign, to try to overwhelm you with its desires so that you obey those bodily desires and those bodily goals and ways of thinking, fleshly ways of thinking. But we need to treat it as a defeated enemy in Christ. We need to treat it as Christ dealt with death and is related to death now. What does he say in uh, our same chapter in verse 9? It's no longer master over him. Done with. And again, I just want to emphasize, because Paul does, chapter 7, he's not saying it's some just magical perfection thing. It's not saying it's easy, that battle against sin. It's not saying that. But he does say, and we'll see this in chapter 8, that it is possible to conquer our sin, to be living in a life of victory. Sure, it might be a little bit of this, but still that upward call, as, Christ, as the Bible says, towards Christ is possible and is ensured if you are in Christ. You have all the tools you need through the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why Paul commands what he does in verse 12. And that's why he goes on in, verses, in verse 13 to get into even the details. So he says, First, our mortal body, sin must not reign in that, but he goes even into the parts, the details. Look at verse 13, just the first part. And do not go on presenting the members of your body, members, parts, the components of your body to sin as instruments, or really, in, in terms of the Bible's usage, weapons of unrighteousness. 
Do not present the members of your body to sin as weapons of unrighteousness. Again, moving from the whole to the parts now. Paul's making the same point, though. And he emphasizes how union with Christ demands a transformation of how we deal with sin, even in the details of our whole being. The way we use our hands, what we do with them, the way we use our eyes, the way we use our brain, every part of us, our feet, our senses, our sexual organs, again, our brain, our thinking, everything, every part of us, every component whoops, that God has created us to have should not be presented to sin as an instrument, as a weapon in the cause, if you will, of unrighteousness. Again, notice that verb that he uses here. Do not go on presenting. Don't present <coughs> unto sin. This is a word that speaks of yielding over, of giving something over, someone over into someone else's disposal. Here you go. Here's this. Here am I. Do with me. Do with it as you will. Completely your choice. This is the idea behind the word here. Even in uh, verse... 16 of the same chapter, look, he uses the same word. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience? Notice that. And that's a really good imagery there. Slaves, we think of that imagery of, I do my master's will. He says, go left, I go left. He says, go right, I go right. He commands, and especially in this first century Greco-Roman context, most, in, most of the mindset of slavery was he can command every part of your life. Not only your full being, but even the private parts of your life. There's no such thing as private, my own home life or my own thing as a slave. No, he's saying everything. When you present, and again, that, that idea of yielding over. Here you go, master. Here's this. Here's my money. Here's my life. Here's this part. Everything. Here you go. Brothers and sisters, this is what we do when we sin. We need to have a biblical view of sin. It's not just a, a whoopsie-daisy. It's not even merely a choice, because Paul's emphasizing here the will. We choose to do sin when we do so. There is a sense, now this doesn't take away from the unbeliever's guilt, but there is a sense where as the Bible calls unbelievers slaves to sin, they can do nothing but sin. And as slaves under with that new nature, they can do nothing but sin. It's not so with us, right? We can choose not to sin. We don't we <clears throat> we've discussed this before in our previous times in Romans 6. We don't ever have to sin, do we? We don't ever are forced to sin. Now, the temptations that come around us and circumstances and people or whatever else, they can come around us and scream and, as it were, hey, and pressure, as it were, us to sin, sin, sin. And it might be, sin might be the easiest option in our own foolish minds. First Corinthians 10 says, no, the Lord is, always gives us a way out. But that's not to say that the temptations aren't strong, but we never have to sin. We never are forced to sin. Paul's emphasizing that willfulness by saying, don't present yourselves to sin. Don't present all the fullness and the parts of your being unto sin as weapons of unrighteousness. Notice that imagery as well. It shows us that even the smallest sins are weapons for the cause of unrighteousness, are tools, are instruments advancing sin and the devils and hells and everything that cause. We must be asking ourselves, brothers and sisters, in our Christian life, what are you choosing? Why are you choosing? Think of the sin that maybe besets you. Is it uh, a sin of the tongue? The book of James calls the tongue perhaps the most sinful member of our bodies, the most dangerous, certainly. It can set worlds on fire, he says. Are we using our tongues to complain, to be bitter, to be angry, to gossip? What are we using our hands for? Are we using our hands for laziness and 
wasteful activities? What do we set our eyes upon? What are we choosing? What are we deciding to do and to think? It's part of our brain, remember our body. We need to be asking, is it? Is this that I'm about to do? Is this that I'm about to think? Is this that I'm about to choose advancing the cause of unrighteousness? Or does it advance, look at the rest of verse 13, does it advance the fall? But present yourselves, Paul says, to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Notice that. You see what Paul does here, by the way? It's very interesting. You can almost divide verse 13 up into three parts, three commands. And notice that Paul adds something to this more positive command. He could have said, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present your body, your members of your body as unto God as instruments of righteousness. But he adds that a little bit before, right? It's kind of sandwiched in between. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. He's calling back to verses 1 through 11. He's calling back, reminding them of who they are. The Christian life isn't just about do's and don'ts. To be very clear, there are do's and there are don'ts. You can boil it down to that Ephesians 4 passage. You put off, you put on. There's also that crucial component of the renewing of your mind. We need to live, as I, as I read from that one theologian at the beginning, we need to actualize what we are. We need to act like you are in Christ Jesus. You are alive from the dead. Think of the account of Lazarus when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he was raised right that moment. He went from a dead, rotting corpse, what, three plus days in the grave? To alive like any of us. And imagine if he came out, and it says there in John, that he came out in grave clothes on, still wrapped up. You can even picture him waddling over to the Lord Jesus. Imagine if after the Lord said that, he came out a little bit and said, Oh, you know what? I'm going to go back into the grave. It was a bit warmer in there. And he goes back into the, the rigor mortis state, and he goes back into that deathly state and wraps himself back up. We, might, we would say, what on earth? Mm. What on earth? I like how Charles Hodge, a great theologian from past centuries, said this, Who, who, having been restored to life, would desire to return to the loathsomeness of the grave? What a crazy notion that would be for a resurrected person, a Lazarus, to go back to death, to, as it were, kill himself and go back into that state after having been risen from the dead Brothers and sisters, in Christ, our status is resurrected ones. Our status and all the glories and privileges and gifts and empowerment therein is alive from the dead. Why are we acting like a bunch of dead people? That's what we do when we sin. And brothers and sisters, I'm not saying this in this sort of, uh, like I've arrived, I've been perfected, oh, I'm in this higher state of sanctification. Certainly not. I say it just as one beggar to another. To another. <clears throat> but we need to see the importance of this. This is in many ways sanctification 101. You have been risen from the dead, just like Paul emphasized. I know we've read this before, but verses 10 and 11, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lived, he lives to God even so. Consider yourself dead to sin. I'm done with that. I'm not dead. I'm alive. Dead to sin. Alive to God. And in turn, again, Paul's emphasizing the details here, members of your body. In turn, this means that we yield every part of ourselves unto God. As he says, present the members as instruments, as weapons in the cause of righteousness unto God. Lord, here I am. What are we just saying? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my silver, take my gold, take my intellect, take my hands. A verse that I didn't have us saying, I don't know why, but just for time's sake, I suppose. Take my feet, and let them be swift and beautiful for thee as I go and I use my feet to spread the gospel. Take me to places 
take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. You can add verses if you want on every other part of our body, every other sense, and everything else. Here you go, Lord. This is all yours. You have purchased me. I forgot who, which uh, old dead guy said it, but we, are, we have been doubly bought. We have been doubly owned by God. Number one, by, by virtue of creation, he owns us. He owns everybody by virtue of creation. He's a creator, we're the creature. We've also been bought by the blood of Christ. We have been owned twice by God. <laughs> and so we say, Lord, oh, I am yours. I am yours. Take everything, Lord. I surrender all. I surrender all. And once again, I mean, we need to be asking ourselves, how have you been obeying in the details of your life this command in light of our union with Christ? And it changes even our decision making. Going this place, going that place, deciding on this life venture, making this goal, fulfilling this desire. Our question shouldn't number one be, well, is it, uh, does it work out? Is it maybe financially X, Y, Z? That's all fine and dandy, but that's all number two, three, four. Number one should be, let me ask, is this pleasing to Christ? Does this advance cause of righteousness? Or does it even in some way use my being, my, my whole person, as an instrument of unrighteousness? Is this choice, even in our entertainment, even in our workplace, even in our uh, church life with one another, the choices that are made there? Everything. Everything, 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 everything. Yielded unto God as instruments of, of righteousness, as those alive from the dead. Now in verse 14, Paul then explains why. He undergirds everything. He reminds us of the whys and the wherefores. Verse 14, For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Notice again, how Paul's emphasizing how these commands that he was just given us, verses uh, 12 and 13, they're all rooted in our new status. As what? as slaves of our Lord Jesus Christ, as servants of a new master. First, he says, sin is not and cannot be Lord over you. That is not a possibility, he says. And really the force of this, it's, you can see it here in the English, but especially in the Greek, it's, it's almost had, a, again, a solemn sense to it. Almost like the Apostle Paul is literally sitting you down, looking you dead in the eyes, putting a hand on your shoulder and saying, sin shall not be master of you. A very clear, sober call to us. And brothers and sisters, through this word, the Holy Spirit speaking to us today, sin cannot, is not, will not be master over you. It is not your Lord anymore. It was and maybe in your own Christian life now, maybe even in just a certain sector of your life, you've been kind of <coughs> acting like it is, but it cannot be anymore. It cannot be. Christ is Lord of you and every part of you. Let me just read a string of verses here. <clears throat> Going back to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. This is, you guys know this verse, it's the Lord's famous statement on money. But the principle of it is very clear and very applicable. The Lord Jesus, your Lord Jesus, said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And I would even say, in terms of the principle of it, insert any other thing in replacement of wealth, and it's the same principle here. Indeed, it might be money for you. Oh, I got to work hard, and the Bible commands me to work hard. Amen, it does, but are you serving it? Are you serving the, the paycheck, as it were? The success, the acclaim? But again, insert anything else. 
And it's the same principle. You cannot serve God and anything else, even the good things of life. This is a especially thing, especially something that Christians can stumble over, myself included. Even the good things, family, friends, uh, church, work, again, like I was just talking about, money. Oh, with so many, so many things that God has given us that are good things in life that we can distort and turn into idols, that we can distort and turn into masters of our lives. Jesus says here, that is not a possibility. There is no straddling the fence. There is no uh, having a job in the morning and then having a night job type of thing, that sort of a double life. That is not happening here with sin and the Lord. Nope. You serve one master, as it were, extending the metaphor. You work for one boss now. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, one of the most uh, piercing verses, piercing uh, words, really, from our Lord Jesus himself. Very clearly. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You want a simple definition of what it means that Jesus is Lord or anything else? Doing what he says. <laughs> That's it. We sing his name, Lord. We talk about the Lord Jesus. We pray to him, Lord Jesus. But in our lives, in the nitty gritty of our lives, in those details, in those hidden areas, whatever, are we doing what he says? Otherwise, how can we profess him to be Lord? Why do you call him Lord, Lord, and just not do what I say? Even the purpose of our very salvation is rooted in that same reality. 2 Corinthians 5.15, Paul says, And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Notice that. You were saved, oh, this is quotable, you were saved to be a slave. <laughs> and that's the slavery to our Lord Jesus Christ, the best master, by the way, the most loving, gracious, kind master. It's a privilege to be a slave to him. But no longer to live for ourselves. We're done with you. We're done with me. We're all about Christ. So that we may live for the one who has loved us, died for us, rose for us, and once again, going back to Romans 6, we are united to that. And yet notice again, going back to Romans, or Romans 6 passage, passage verse 14, notice how he broadens this out. He broadens the scope of the discussion and brings in law and grace. Let me read that part again. It says, so sin shall not be master over you. Okay. Well, why is that? Why can sin not be master anymore? Because you are not under law. You are under grace. I was not speaking about a specific law like the Mosaic law that the Jews were under that Paul was talking about in chapter 2. He's talking about law as a system, as a principle, as a quality. Lawness versus graceness. A law system versus a grace system. And the word under there emphasizes subordination. We are no longer under the rule and reign and authority of law, we are under the rule of grace. We are under the authority, we are incorporated, if you will, into a grace system now. But why is this cru truth so crucial? And even in my own study of this, I, you can see how Paul's flow of thought going right from the top of the chapter all the way through, it's very logical, very clear, but then he brings up this law and grace thing again. What is the What's the connection there? Well, to, we need to be reminded, context of what we've already seen in the book, we need to be reminded of what Paul means by law. If you want to follow along with these, that's fine, but I'll just skim through, starting from chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Notice Paul says about the law, or a law system, really. For all who have sinned without law will also perish without law, and all who have sinned under law will be judged by law. For 
It is not the hearers of law who are just before God, but the doers of law who will be justified. God demands for those who subscribe to a law system, and that's everyone outside of Christ, if you want to be perfect in God's sight, justified by Him through law, through gaining merit by obeying, okay, but you've got to be perfect. Top to bottom, no excuses, no days off, perfect. It's not just those who hear it and like it and even say yes and amen. No, it's the doers of it, perfect doers of it, who will be declared by God, and we saw this in Romans 3, declared by God just in his sight. You want to go law system? Perfection is the standard. Moving on to chapter 3, verse 20, which is the very first part of it. It's the famous verse where he says, Because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight. We look at that chapter 2, verse, it's two verses really, and we, we think, man, perfection, that is not possible. Yep. And that's why works of law, no one's going to be justified in that way. And again, this is everyone outside of Christ. This is everyone and every religion. It's a merit system of do, 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 and then maybe God will accept you. Or Roman Catholicism, God will kind of give you a push, but you've got you to use that and do your best along the way. Otherwise, he won't justify you again. And any kind of system of merit and working to please God, to be accepted in His sight, to be a child of God, no one's, that's never going to work. And that, Paul is saying all this stuff, and he did Romans 1, and he did Romans 2, and he did the first part of Romans 3 to burden those, to say this is impossible. This ain't going to happen. That's why he goes on even to chapter 4, Verse 15, and he recognizes this by saying, for the law brings about wrath. That's all that's going to happen if you want to do the merit system with God. If you want to do the self-obedience, my way with God. You want to do that? That's, that's a road to wrath. And really, in many ways, it should, it's almost like it, if, I, uh, if I had ten quarterbacks or... I guess linemen are bigger guys, big football players, we'll just say. And I had 10 of them dogpile on you, just the whole weight of all of them on you. Every part of your body is pinned to the ground. You couldn't even lift your head. You can barely open your mouth to respond. When I tell you then, all right, get up. All right, try to move off from, move off that weight. It's impossible. No way. There is no, you can't even move a muscle. Uh, from below that weight. That same impossibility drives the sinner. That is the, the position of everyone under law. The impossibility of pleasing God. And what does that mean then? If you can't please God, sin. <laughs> That's all you got left. Just a life of sin, 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 sin. What does Hebrews 12, uh, 12 verse 6 say? He who comes to God, it's by faith. It's the only way you can please God. Those without faith, those outside of a, a grace system, cannot please God. So it's just sin, 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 sin. Furthermore, your master is sin. It's almost like a slave master with a whip whipping further and further and further. You can't get out from under that. There is no way. There's no way to please God, and there is no way that you could say, oh, I'm free from sin. Oh, it's no longer a master over me. There is no way you could, uh, apart from grace, apart from Christ, there is no way anybody can obey verses 12 and 13 of Romans 6. No way. Not a, not a single day, not a single second. No way. Impossible. And yet, you see already, I hope, how this contrasts with grace being under race. Remembering back to chapter 5, verse 17, for by the transgression of the one Adam, death reigned through the one Adam. Much more those who have received the abundance of grace, the favor of God, and the gift, he says, of righteousness 
Not the merit of righteousness, the gift, the free gift, that had nothing to do with you, will reign in life through the one. Verse 20 and 21 of that same chapter. The law came in, there it is. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. That's all that the law could do. That's all that anyone under a law system could do. Just sin it up and get worse and worse in their sin. Ah, the grace. He's, Paul goes on to say, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Drowned it out by the abundance of grace. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see the power of you see the freedom from sin and slavery therein that grace brings. You see now why Paul says the fundamental bedrock reality of why you Romans, of why you believers here today can obey 12 and 13. It's because you're not, remember, you're not in that law system. You're not in uh, under that dog pile of sin and, and law and an inability to please God free from that. You are completely free because your favor before God is in Christ. Your position before God is in Christ. And that has nothing to do with you. <laughs> as Christ, as perfect as Christ is, as alive as Christ is, so are you. Fully pleasing to God in the grace system. As Thomas Brooks said, the Puritan said, you know, in a law system apart from Christ, all our best deeds are but glorious sins. Whitewashed tombs, right? But under the grace of Christ accomplished in the gospel and appropriated in our lives through union with him, applied by the power of the Spirit, sin cannot be your master. That's why. And instead of obeying God's law to gain merit, to kind of please Him, oh, let me do this <coughs> the Son of God. No, we obey Him out of love. Not because we are whipped into doing so, not because we have to or else we get wrath, because we want to. It's our Heavenly Father, we love Him. He's poured out His grace. He's given us the gift of righteousness. Can but do, what else can we do? What else can we do? I couldn't even say it better, obviously, than Romans chapter 8, 2 and 4. Paul says there's the law or principle or the system of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law, the principle of sin and death. Free from that. Verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, through this sinful mortal body, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of law might be fulfilled in us. That's what the law could do. The law could never enable you to obey. The law could never enable you to be pleasing in God's sight. The law could never enable you to be meritorious in God's sight. Never. But God did it through Christ. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Paul goes on to say, describing believers as those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We do not live now according to our own power, our own will, we live according to the Spirit. Once again, Paul will delve into that once we get there in chapter 8. But that's why Paul brings up on grace. That's the, that's the bedrock, brothers and sisters. Now I emphasize this because if you are doing your Christian life, you are growing in Christ, and that ought to be a desire, because if, if, that, if there's no desire to grow in Christ, there's no life. Trusting that that's the case for all of us here today. If you are doing it in the flesh, if you are doing it in your own power, or if you are merely treating it, okay, I just got to do it, just because I got to do it, or this is a Christian thing to do, or I don't want to be embarrassed, or I don't want to bring shame upon this or that person, or a zillion of other things. But if it's not based in this freedom that is found in the grace of Christ. And if it is not based in the reality that I'm a child of God, and it's not based on what I do or have done, it's based in Christ's work, which is perfect.
perfect and it will never, ever be taken away, secure. It's not, if your sanctification is not rooted in that, it's going to go up, it's going to go wrong, it's going to get off base. It won't be that true power that ought to be there, but if it's based on that, and then on that foundation with those, uh, that floor, that firm foundation that you can be, put your feet on to obey 12 and 13 and all the other commands from your blessed Master and Lord, that's where the growth comes. That's where you can say with Paul, praise the Lord, sin is less and less in my life. I'm fighting against sin. I'm growing in Christ. Sin is not my Master. You can live in the freedom and power, not perfection this side of heaven, but growth and maturity and usefulness for him. Why? Because of that free and sovereign love of Christ poured out, like he says in chapter 5, poured out in our hearts based on Christ's merit alone. We can obey him. We can heed Paul's command to not let sin reign in our mortal body, not obey those bodily lusts, not present the members of our body to sin as unrighteousness, as instruments of unrighteousness. We can obey. We can present ourselves to God as those life from the dead. We can present our members as instruments of, of righteousness to God. We can, in Christ, rooted in His grace. I'm going to close our time with Romans chapter 12, the famous first two verses. Because Paul says the same thing there. It's the same heartbeat where he says, Therefore, I urge you, I call to you, brothers and sisters here today, that's what the Lord is doing to you as well. Brethren, by the mercies of God, notice that rooted in God's work, in His gracious mercy towards you, I urge you, firm in that foundation to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God which is your spiritual service worship notice the language there worship not spiritual service of drudgery of oh I got to law or something like that no I want to obey that law because I love him and I want to live my life as a worship a worship song as it were top to bottom 24 hours a day and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that here's the goal so that you can prove what the will of God is not what my will is not what I want not what sin wants not what the devil wants that's, that's done no, so that I can prove and understand and do what God wants of me and what is it that was good and acceptable and perfect I hope Paul's words in Romans 6, 12 through 14 have provided perhaps a convicting word to you because it can be very easy in the busyness of life to be caught up and to be a little lazy or uh, lose focus with our battle with sin. So may it convict as the Holy Spirit allows. May it also be a rich encouragement, an empowering boost <laughs> of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives to, to live according to the will of God in every part of our person as instruments of righteousness not as slaves to sin but slaves to God but the best master our Heavenly Father why don't we talk to him now in prayer okay and truly though I'll be speaking in, in prayer Truly, I pray it's our heart's desire what we were just talking about. Lord, let it be so. Lord, I pray for myself as the chief of sinners, for all my brothers and sisters here. Oh, may we heed your apostles' very clear calls to us based in such a free grace based in our status in union with Christ, based in these things, to live and give and yield over the entirety of our being and all the parts and details therein to you for the cause of righteousness, to please.
please you. Not as a drudgery, not as a, a scared little slave of the, the whip of the cruel master, no, but as willing slaves of a loving master, as sons to our heavenly Father. Let it be so, Lord. Holy Spirit, empower this even in the struggles with sin that you know that are in our hearts and lives and in the trials and the temptations in our lives and families and everything else, Lord. Empower it. Use us for your glory. I pray in Christ's name.